You're ready. You're, we're live. Oh, great. Right now. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, I, my name is Targul, and I would like to welcome you here on behalf of um, Anthropology and Social Change uh, Department, where I teach, and on behalf of Medicine for Nightmares, where I come for medicine. <laughs> and thank you so much for hosting us. Tuan and Josiah, and for this beautiful portal that you have created. I am super excited to just very briefly introduce Dr. Linda Kikivish, known belovedly to us as Kiki, who is going to um, present on her newly published book, Palestine 1492, A Report Back. And um, I don't know, I could say many, many things about Kiki, um, I have the privilege of having known her since 2012. I won't make this a long introduction. I just want to say that I don't know um, another person who can clarify the complexity of the power structures that we're living through so succinctly and with so much integrity and someone who I have seen always trying to escape capture, whether it's from the academy or other forms of containment. So thank you so much for sharing your word and your work. And this is, we've been waiting this for a while, for a while and we're super, super, super excited <coughs> to hear you speak and present your beautiful book. Thank you, Kiki. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much to Medicine for Nightmares. This is, uh, I can't think of a, of a better portal for, for this talk or the first time that I'm presenting this book to you, which I hope that, that you will find helpful as medicine uh, for these times, for these really difficult times that we're in. Um, I have been very privileged, very honored to, to have been mentored by really beautiful hearts conceptual healers, conceptual curanderas, curanderos, curanderes. And I hope that I can share that with you too in that way. Because um, I, I often felt myself, uh, my concepts just being unlocked and new worlds being opened up and new avenues through conversations and concepts, philosophies and pra practices that I've witnessed and that they've shared. So. I just want to begin by just telling you a little bit about this book. This book uh, has been midwived by Talbot and Mesbron for six years. It's a book that is, is largely based on my own uh, doctoral research as a geographer in Palestine. I lived in Palestine in 2010, 2011 to do my research. I was researching the borders of Palestine having been fascinated by borders in a way that, you know, I, I wanted to understand borders because my family crossed and documented the Mexico-Guatemala border and the U.S.-Mexico border. And um, I, I detail it a lot more in this book, which um, has been, the, the contents of this book have taken so long because it's been such a conversation with folks about like what voice to use who to write it for, what to include, and something that I kept getting a lot of feedback on is that my own process of even learning about Palestine and going there is really important to share because a lot of folks are increasingly undergoing these kinds of internal turmoils when it comes to questioning the world and, and something really difficult like how victims of a Holocaust could become the oppressors of others. And so that has, that, that is really like the underlying thread of so much of my work is this question. How is it that we become the monsters that we fight and how is it that we can prevent becoming the monsters that we fight? Because there really aren't very many avenues for that. So this book is also something that I produced in, a, as a graphic designer, as an illustrator, as um, 
someone who has produced books for others before, I decided I would just produce my own. Um, also so that it could just travel more freely without having, you know, ha without being caught up in licensing agreements and rights uh, that, that big publishers, or most publishers actually demand. Um, I was really inspired by the autonomous presses in Latin America that just do that. Uh, and so it's an experiment and it's an all volunteer production. It's been volunteer edited um, by Palestinian, Egyptian, Mexican compas, and as I said, midwife by our dear Targol. Um, so what you're seeing right now with this is a pre-release version. Um, something that my midwife gave me was deadlines, which I really needed. <laughs> um, and so it was really nice uh, earlier in the spring to show a draft to her class. I don't know if anyone from that class is here. I think I met a couple of folks. Yeah, so I'm so curious to know what you think about the draft and then the final version. And so in a pre-release form, it's also still needing to be proofread a bit, so I'm doing some proofreading, but I wanted to, to share it with folks in case they, I mean, they might find, they might find it nice to have some art, you know, um, and to kind of get a sense. I was a professional copy editor, and it's really hard to copy edit your own stuff, especially, because, and this is the thing that I had trouble with writing, because I love editing. And I kept editing my own writing as I was writing it. And so it was never getting finished. And so the way this book is going to get proofread is by me not being able to edit it, right? I have to have it in hand with like a pencil or a red pen. Um, so the, when it's released to the general public, it will be proofread. And that should be in about two weeks, inshallah, hopefully. Uh, so I'm going to read from it. Uh, but I also want to present first, or and I also want to present to you a bit about it. This is the cover, and I'll explain a little bit what the cover front part is. Um, actually, I'll explain it right now. Uh, the front cover is a map of Guatemala, Chiapas, and the Caribbean oriented facing east toward Palestine, because that's where I was when I started to face Palestine. I was going to do my dissertation on the Mexico-Guatemala border. And it was summer 2006, and I had just backpacked Palestine, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Egypt six months before, just because I was so curious about you know, what was happening. And, and, I, and I go through that in, in this book a little bit. But as I was getting ready to study the Mexico-Guatemala border, and I also wanted to get to know the Zapatistas, that uh, Israel launched a war on Lebanon that summer in 2006, and I noticed that in CNN and Espanol, the coverage was very different from CNN in English on my laptop. And I think I felt what maybe a lot of folks are, have been feeling over the last year, where they're seeing the mainstream news say one thing, but then social media is saying something else. And for me, it was a moment where I just couldn't believe how much of a lie I had been living. And so I wanted to um, also shout out you know, the ways that Native geographies, and in particular, Maya geography. This book is very informed by Maya geography, which I've been studying over the last few years, and more increasingly, Maya religion and Maya cosmovision, where, like a lot of Native traditions, we face the East. So even Europe's maps before modern Europe, those maps would be oriented at the top with the East, where the sun would rise, which is very common in a lot of geographies. So. Um, I also want to point out this map. I'm sorry, this <laughs> So this book is very history heavy, geography heavy, theory heavy, and personal narrative heavy. And part of that personal narrative I realized as I was writing it is Tupac Shakur. Mm. Tupac Shakur, um, I'm showing just, he, Tupac shows up a few times in this book. 
And one was that when I first backpacked Palestine and I landed in Jerusalem the next morning and I was studying photography, I was very shy about photographing because it can be very intrusive. And I was looking at my camera roll as I was putting this book together and I was like, oh, I need this photo, I need this photo. And I realized that the first photograph in my camera roll was of a brick in Jerusalem that had the graffiti Tupac. And the, the, the charcoal drawing is a drawing that I did of Tupac in 2003 that is in the book when I talk about how I started to volunteer in a refugee camp while I was there to teach art. And I had to go through this whole thing like, I don't know if I'm gonna do it right. Like, you know, in Islam, you're not supposed to draw the human form because of idol worship, you know? And so I, I had this, I'm like, am I gonna, I'm gonna mess up, you know? And so I, I had conversations with the camp, like, no, no, it's totally fine. And it was a really lovely experience, although I realized that, that the youth in ID camp did not like the charcoal, and that was like the only thing that I knew how to do. Um, but then, you know, we go on this, uh, on this trip, this little adventure, they hold me by the hand, and they take me around the camp to go find colored chalk. And so I wanna kind of point out what, how the book is laid out, because it does have these personal stories. So the book begins in the East, and it's, the section is called Palestine from Below, and the first chapter is diary entries of mine that I kept. I, I wrote a diary entry every day when I was in Palestine, and I never thought I was going to publish them. Then I started to read them last year, and I was like, wow, like, this is a really special look just at everyday life in Palestine, which is what I went for. I wanted to see, because I was learning from the Zapatistas about power from above and power from below, and I was studying maps. And so I was studying how maps from above are the very uh, state formation, kind of technocratic, bureaucratic kind of way of understanding power, and then power from below. Like there's geographies that are created all the time in everyday life. So I have some stories from my diary in this book in the first chapter, there's 25 entries, and I'll read a couple tonight. And then the second chapter is uh, when the rooftops are streets, it's the, the camp, I did refugee camp that I was volunteering at, asked me to map the camp. And so I talk about the different ways that, you know, the conversations that we had about it, um, and the different ways that maps exist in the camp, which it was actually something that I learned from Palestinians in the camp about the map. I have been so angry at maps doing my research because they're colonial tools. And so I was like, you don't want to map the camp. You know, maps have ruined everything. And they taught me actually the map, it depends. You know, you can use it as a tool. And so the second chapter talks about that. And then the third chapter, To Die Standing, talks about the Zapatistas and Palestinians together. Mostly about the Zapatistas, because I, I, the feedback that I received from Palestinian compas is that they needed to know more about who the Zapatistas were. And um, Panthers and Jaguars talks about Maya political theory and Black Panther radical uh, political theory together with George Jackson and me losing the fight <coughs> to George Jackson in his book Blood in My Eye. It was the last book that I read before I moved to Palestine, and he was calling America the most advanced fascism, and he had written it in 1971, and I was arguing with him while he hadn't seen Israel, you know. And then when I was there, I ended up losing a fight to him, and I explained how that went in the book. So that's Palestine from below, and that's east. The second section is west, Palestine from above. And this is how Palestine has been mapped from above by empires, by colonizers, the view from above. And it talks a lot about the Roman Empire, but not just the Roman Empire, the, the problem of empire itself. And empire, the way that I define empire, is that logic and practice of circulating power from above and below where you know, there's, there's energy that's extracted from below to be concentrated above. And of course there's force, violent force, but not just violent force. And this is where I learned from George Jackson. There's also willful participation in it. That's the most efficient mode of domination of force. 
So I, I also, so I talk about, I'll read a chapter called Speak of the Devil that talks a little bit about that. Something that's really important to me too is to share the, the debates that I've, I've undergone over the last 20 years about this question of religion, which is very important with Palestine. I was raised in a very secular movement world of Palestine where, you know, the whole, the whole, um, framework does not like to talk about religion, saying that this is not a religious problem. And I understand, I think, what people mean by that, because I used to say that, and I think that what people mean is that they just don't want to have to pick one religion over the other, as one is superior and one is inferior. And I agree. And so I try to, try to tease that out by showing that there is a Christianity from above and a Christianity from below. A Judaism from above, a Judaism from It's like there's a Marxism from above and a Marxism from below, an anarchism from above and anarchism from below. And these are captures, right? Captures of, of many resistance movements, including Christianity and Jesus, as we know, as I think is common knowledge, was struggling against the Roman Empire, against empire. But it's not really talked about that way. Well, empire captures Christianity, you know, 300 years later. So I also then talk about uh, Columbus and 1492. So this is where 1492 comes in, which is a very different way of looking at Palestine that is common in, in terms of usually we begin with 1948 and want to resist falling into the trap that says, well, they've always been fighting since forever, which then makes it like nihilistic, like, well, you can't do anything about it, right? And so I try to be careful with that because I don't want to make it seem as if we can't do anything about it. And I also want to historicize a little bit back because I want to globalize it. I'm arguing that this is a world problem, which I feel like a lot of us feel, but we may not have a lot of the, the concepts for that. How is it a world problem exactly? So that's what the book is, is talking about. Palestine is a, a problem of the world, not just of Zionism. It's a problem of empire. And the world that we're in right now is a global empire. The Fourth World War, which is the next section south. The Fourth World War, which is a concept, a political concept that the Zapatistas introduced to me. I don't know if they were the first to do it, but that's the first place I heard it, was with the Zapatistas. And, what they talk about is that, you know, we talk a lot about the Cold War, but the Cold War was actually very hot for the world outside of NATO and the Soviet Union. That was the Third World War. And there's a lot of talk about, is this gonna be Third World War? Is this gonna be the Third World War? And what the Zapatistas and a lot of movements from below say, we've already been through the horrors of a Third World War. Actually, we're in the Fourth World War right now. And the Fourth World War, as they say, is, the war that started once the Soviet Union fell, once the Third World War ended, once the so-called badly named Cold War ended, the Fourth World War is the condition of globalization that a lot of us who lived through the 1990s especially saw this shift where now capital was supposedly triumphant and now it's going to be imposed on the whole globe. And so then what that did was it shifted the framework of war away from states versus states into global capital against anything that gets in its way. That's Fourth World War. So in this section south, the Fourth World War, is where I talk about like, my own personal process in all of this. I talk about it like, through my own uh, upbringing as a child of undocumented migrants who had citizenship, and so that's something very important in an undocumented family, the one that has citizenship, the ciudadana, ciudadano, because of what's possible in, in, in assimilation, you know, and, and there's a lot of trauma in that. And so there's this, there, like what we're taught is to assimilate into Americana. And what that is, is assimilating into the above. And assimilating into the above means that there's going to remain a below, because the below is the foundation of the above. And so it's a highly unethical move. And so that's, some, that's part of that turmoil that I underwent, but it was also very liberatory to, to understand from other worlds that the above below world is just one world. There are many other worlds and there's other ways to circulate power side by side by side by side. I get that a lot from the Zapatistas who 
or Maya, and a lot of their political theory, of course, is Maya, based on ancient ancestral Maya philosophy. And I also have a chapter on capital, and I'll read that today. I've heard that's probably going to be uh, helpful for uh, lots of folks who are graduate students right now. And I, basically, I wrote the book I wish I would have read, uh, where someone could please explain, could you please explain capitalism to me? You know, like, when I was in graduate school, it was really hard for me to ask a question because I felt like I had to perform that I was intelligent. And I, and I realized later that my classmates were doing that too because it's, you know, you become a PhD student and now the world just assumes that you're intelligent. And so then you, you, you I, <laughs> I feared, and my compas, after we confessed to each other three years later, I'm like, what did Foucault say? I have no idea what Foucault said, you know? <laughs> it was so liberating to confess this to each other because we ended up doing study groups together where we would help each other rather than keep performing that one knows more than the other in front of the professor who you're trying to impress, you know? That was my experience. I don't know if that's your experience, but... Uh, so, uh, after I left academia 10 years ago, I decided to come back home to Oxnard, to Southern California, and teach the university classes that I, that I taught in parks, in public parks, like reading out loud. And we spent several months reading out loud section one of Capital Volume One on the commodity, reading it out loud, and I was facilitating it. And I'm facilitating it with people who aren't paying tuition, aren't trying to get a degree. They just really want to know what capitalism is. And so I, I couldn't bullshit, you know? Because no one was forcing them to be there. Um, they weren't trying to get a degree. They genuinely wanted to understand. So then I had to spend, it was on Sundays, and so I had to spend the Saturday beforehand all day trying to get through like a whole paragraph. What is he saying? You know, and then reading people's notes about it. I'm like, oh. And it was so rewarding to do that, but it was something that I realized I didn't have that kind of time to do that in graduate school because there's so much reading and you're on a schedule. And so you gotta get through it fast and you don't often have time to sit with it, right? And actually reading out loud is something that I, I learned to do in Palestine. I was asked by the Haitian refugee camp, some compas there to teach a class on the Zapatistas. And so we read the sixth declaration but this is like their third, English is like their third, fourth language, you know, and so I wasn't going to give homework and then expect people to come having done the readings uh, because I know, like, as a student myself, like, I wouldn't do all the readings. Like, some life happens, you know, and what I really wanted to do was have really good conversations. So what we ended up doing was projecting the reading on the wall and reading it out loud and pausing and then having conversations and doing that. And later... Um, I would do that at Brown University where I was a postdoc very briefly and one of my reviews, student reviews, said this is the first time I learned how to read. And later as I was studying how to, how to be an adult literacy facilitator, teacher, I learned that that's actually a technique. It's called comprehension. It's not just pronouncing the words. It's pausing. Okay, what did we just read? Okay. And that gives people time to ask a question of what does this word mean? What does that word mean? And so I would do that in my class a lot. Like if you know we're trying to figure out what this text says, then we need to make sure we're all comprehending what these words are, right? And so like if you're using this word neoliberalism, you need to define it. If you're using this word capitalism, you need to define it so that it stops being slogans and we're actually talking about how we're using words. Because I realized that a lot of the clashes that we have, just in general, is that we're using words and we think that we know what they mean. And, and, and then <laughs> we don't really pause to ask, how are you using that word? Oh, I use that word differently. Okay, it doesn't matter what word you use as long as we know how you're using it in the end, right? So we'll read a little, we'll read that chapter capital, which, um, comes from that experience of being in the park, reading Marx and trying to figure out what he said. <laughs> so hopefully it'll be helpful. I think, I think that it could be helpful just because it's helpful to me. So I'm gonna try to share it with you all. And then the last section is called North and it's called a world where all the worlds fit. 
And there, I talk about how, how is power circulating above and below? How can we circulate it side by side? What is the difference between strategy and tactics in that work, in our work? And what is it that we have in common? What is the common thing that we might have? And so we'll read from strategy and tactics. And we'll talk a little bit about chess. How does that sound? <laughs> so I just want to show you then the, this is section east. And it begins with a map of Aida camp. Uh, as I was mapping the camp, I was asking them, can you check the streets? Did I do it OK? And a company doll as Azraq said, yeah, but you know, the rooftops are also streets. You know, when we're under curfew, we have to jump the rooftops to get food, medicine, check in on each other, second intifada map. And so that's his map of Ida camp, the rooftops of the street. And that's the whole section in the book. The next section west, Palestine from above, something really critical that we'll talk about is how the world was cut into borders. So 1492 introduces global linear thinking. And the first border was the cut made by Rome, the Treaty of Tordesillas, that after Columbus's voyage west, he comes back and Portugal and Castile start to fight. And the Pope wants to make the peace. He's like, let me cut the globe for you. And then Castile, you can invade everything to the west and Portugal, everything to the east. So like Africa, historically, has been invaded by Portugal. And of course, the cut goes where uh, modern day Brazil is. So in Brazil, that's why Portuguese is spoken. And over to the west, Spanish is spoken. South, we have the Fourth World War. And again, the map of the Maya world and the Caribbean oriented toward Palestine. The Caribbean being very important as the first who got hit uh, in 1492. And then north, a world where all the worlds fit, not just many worlds. I used to say a world where many worlds fit, and that was a Zapatista saying for a very long time, and I loved it. And they, they just updated it <laughs> uh, to a world where all the worlds fit. And I love that one even more, especially because like right now we're in a situation where the so-called left wants a multipolar world. So many empires, not just one. So that's still not a world where all the worlds fit, right? That's the world where many worlds fit, but we need to, we need to really talk about like the ones who don't fit right now. And so this section, the last chapter called The Commons, it's about me losing a fight to the Afro-pessimists. And uh, I, I won't get into that unless you want me to read it, but um, it's, it, it was a, a beautiful encounter and learning when to lose a fight, I realized health may be stronger because it sharpens. And, and the Afro-pessimists are serious warriors that are incredibly rigorous. And I know that they're very controversial. And I talk about that here, about the importance of that challenge. So I'll begin just with a brief presentation and then we'll start reading. And the way I usually like to begin Palestine 1492 is by showing this map. It's a map of the world, according to Europe, in 1581, so 100, almost 100 years after 1492, and has Jerusalem in the middle, in the center of the world, Palestine, surrounded by three clovers, or three leaf clovers, uh, the continent Europe, which is not a continent, Asia and Africa. And over on the corner, there's a blob of Abi Ayala labeled America. The encounter with Abi Ayala really revolutionized the mental map of Europe in terms of what the world was because it, it hadn't been part of their creation story. And so you see that Abi Ayala America is over in the corner of the blog because it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit into this geography of this clover. And this map is based on uh, the three supposed continents. is based on very medieval maps. Here's the, the medieval map on the left side of Asia, Europe, and Africa. And I also want to point out this map over on the right to show Europe is not a continent. 
But Europe likes to say that it's a continent. And if you look at the medieval map, it puts it, Europe puts itself side by side to Africa. And the map is oriented with east at the top. Orient comes from this, this move. Uh, where the sun rises and it's also like a very religious, spiritual map of where heaven is. It's closer to like Jerusalem, the Garden of Eden. And this is interesting because the world map starts to change where Europe gets put in the center, where Europe gets orient, where, where the map gets oriented, where the north is at the top. And not only that, but Europe calls itself the West, which means West of Jerusalem. Right? And it forces all of us to call it the West, even when it's to our, our East. Right? So as secular as Europe says it is, it's still orienting itself to this sacred geography where its reference is Jerusalem. So like for me, it's always been weird. Just, and that's like, I put this right there where California is, um, where you know we're, the east is to our west, but we're supposed to call it the east, and then the west is over to our east, but we're supposed to call it the west, you know. And not only that, there's there's this shift in geography. There's also this shift in time. Europe. This is usually what the world map looks like with Europe at the center. The time zones begin at Europe. Hour zero begins at Greenwich mean time. And all of us are supposed to orient our clocks that way, right? So this is just stuff that has always bothered me and nobody talks about it. And then I, you know, as I'm writing this book and I'm doing this research, I was like, this is actually part of its contradictions that it doesn't like to say out loud. Like modern Europe, the world of 1492 is extraordinarily religious, but it likes to call itself secular. And secular is a move to make it seem as if there isn't a religious foundation to a philosophy, to a world, and that is just normal nature. It's a way to take away the political and the economic uh, as, as it's just, you know, it's neutral, and religion is what's not neutral. Uh, and so I also want to point out here, um, This math, when I talk about 1492, I don't begin at October 12th. I begin on January 2nd, which is the final battle. There was hundreds of years long battle in the Iberian Peninsula with the Catholic monarchs and the Moors, uh, 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 black Muslims from Africa. And Granada was the last stronghold in the Iberian Peninsula, and it surrendered on January 2nd, 1492, which began this ethnic cleansing, didn't begin, solidified, because <laughs> it was already happening, an ethnic cleansing of the Iberian Peninsula from anything that was, anybody that was different, Jews and Muslims. And so this is where everyone had to convert or they had to leave, back when there was places you could still go. And if you converted, if you're a Jew who converted to Catholicism but were still Jewish in secret, they had this inquisition where they would demand that you tell the truth by torturing you, right? And, and this is actually something that was really helpful to me because there was an inquisition here. Everyone was forced in Abiyayala during those first centuries to become Christian. Right, force, and there was an inquisition if you were faking it. The Maya books were all burned. There are only four that are known to be in existence, and that's because one of them was recently discovered in a cave. The other three were just curiosities that the Europeans took to Europe, and they were just like in someone's attic for a long time, and that's why they survived. But a lot. Of, what, the point is that so much of what happened on the land with 1492 port was already happening between Europeans within Europe. There's a Europe from above and a Europe from below. The Europe from below is very weak after having been crushed, enslaved, uh, 
their slavery, serfdom, right? Like the enclosures. There's so much violence that has happened internally to Europe that has then been exported out to the rest of the world. And in a lot of ways, that's what has created modern Europe as a so-called peaceful place, is that violence has been exported out to non-Europe so that Europeans don't fight each other. They can go fight other people. This is actually like the, 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 the legal jurists, this is, this is exactly how they designed the world in 1492, in Spanish, the Spanish jurists. That was also adopted then by the rest of Western Europe. I went to Granada in uh, August 2021. The Zapatistas were making their trip to Europe on the 500 year anniversary of the taking of the Nostritlan. And so I was hanging out in Granada and I noticed this uh, right across, so there's a, a, a very uh, famous palace, the Moorish Palace, the Alhambra, in Granada that tourists just line up to go see. And right across from that is another palace, the Palace of the Forgotten. And they have an Inquisition exhibit with all of the torture methods. And so I went in and I was, you know, there's waterboarding, like all of the things that we're so familiar with now. These are techniques from back then. And there's also a statue surrounded by like three department stores and a bank of Isabella and Columbus making a deal. <laughs> and on the pedestal, you see January 2nd, 1492, and October 12th, 1492. And later I went to Madrid to go connect with the Zapatistas in Columbus Square, and Columbus Square in Madrid also begins its monument with January 2nd. This is how Spain understands itself. There are two mon momentous events, January 2nd and October 12th, and we're usually just told about October 12th. But the way that I can understand their connection is that on January 2nd, it was an imposition of one world on that territory. One world, you could only be one way. You had to convert, assimilate, or leave. And then October 12th, the continued imposition of one world. And what we have 500 years later is that continued imposition of one world on the globe, called capital today. Because it's not just the West. It's not just the West that is captured by capital. It is so much of the globe from above. So beginning then with 1492, and the thing is that this book, it understands time as a spiral, not a less of less of a line and more of a spiral, right? And what that means is that like if time is a spiral, this is very Maya metaphysics. If time is a spiral, then you're constantly walking, being accompanied by the past. You're looking at the past in front of you and, and the side of you and the future. So the present, past, and future are all happening at once, right? So the book kind of takes this, this, this back and forth, back and forth to weave a story. So it doesn't go in a linear way. And even though the title is Palestine 1492, it takes it way back even more than that. But in 1492, and this is a, one of the arguments that I, that I make about Palestine, this, this question of borders. I go to Palestine to study borders. And so with 1492, what we get, as I mentioned, Columbus comes back and tells the Portuguese about it first, about what he found first. He landed in Portugal, even though Castile is the one that funded it. Isabella from Castile and the statue, she gets, oh man, they get into a fight, the Pope steps in and cuts the line. Cuts the line, says everything to the west, Castile you go invade, everything to the east, Portugal you go invade. And then of course, like later, this is the Treaty of Tordesillas, which I remember hearing about in high school, and it was just not interesting. Like, I wish someone would have told me this story. It would have been a lot more interesting. Because it has consequences. This is the first global border. Even though it wasn't actually like put in place on the, you know, just the idea that you could cut up the globe and divide it into, ter into ownership. We end up getting this continued logic with the cutting up of Avi Ayala into viceroyalties, 
colonies that are the footprints of today's nation states. So what I argue is that borders are agreements between the above so that they don't fight. But they continue fighting the below. The below isn't cons consulted, there's no consent. The land, there's no consent, right? The people, zero consent. It's peace treaties between the above. And whenever Native Americans have tried to get into these peace treaties with Europeans, they'll write the peace treaty, but they just won't enforce it. They won't accept it. It's just, it's trash, right? Like, borders are for the above. Invaders, contracts between invaders, agreements, so that they don't fight. And again, that's coming from this logic of 1492. Actually, Tree Tordesillas was 1494, so almost right away. We also then get this colonial reflection, as some scholars call it, back to Europe. So Europe then starts cutting itself up into these homogenous spaces. This is from the Treaty of uh, Westphalia. There was a 30-year war in Europe that kind of inaugurated a secular order uh, in 1648 and started to cut up the, at least mentally anyway, because the cartography wasn't there yet. There were still just, maps were really just lists of places rather than like the, the maps that we know of today, the modern maps, the Cartesian grid. And so we get the Holy Roman Empire plays a really important role. And it's, I always, want to, I always need to share that, that Voltaire quote that the Holy Roman Empire was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. It was something that was created, christened by the Pope after the fall of the Western Roman Empire. Like you still wanted, you still wanted the status of that there's an empire, right? Because there's a fetish of empire with the history from above. So what we end up getting in the future is the na nation states inside Europe and the two that are the, the late ones to quote unquote unify are Germany and Italy. And what is meant by unif the unification of Germany, the unification of Italy was the annihilation of difference. Oh, those there are so many languages, so many different worlds, right? And they all have to be erased so that there can be a nation, a nation, right? The homogenization of territory through the nation state. And so Germany comes in late into the imperial game because the Holy Roman Empire ends up being like super fractured. The Holy Roman Empire is the first Reich to Hitler's Third Reich. The first Reich, the Holy Roman Empire. The second Reich, the state of Germany at so-called unification in 1871. When you get the so-called unification of Germany in 1871, Germany is late to the imperial game and wants a piece of the pie. And so Germany calls the Berlin Conference to cut up Africa, just like Abiy Ayala had been cut up. And this is called also the Congo Conference, where the Congo gets gifted to King Leopold II as his personal property. And it really is people with a map on the wall of Europeans around a table negotiating it. I don't know if you can see the Turk uh, with the fez. You know what it is. He's the sad one, you know, the Ottoman Empire is falling, that's what that's supposed to resemble. What we end up getting is the cutting up of Africa between European powers. And these are the footprints of nation state borders that we have today in Africa. So again, with this cutting up of the land, and again, this is so that the Europeans don't fight each other, right? They want to conquer but they're like very peacefully agreeing to it at, at the table amongst themselves. And of course we end up getting eventually like Germany and Italy cannibalizing Europe itself, you know, in World War I, World War II. The cutting up of Africa was decade, a decades long process that by the, by the 19 teens, it had been mostly cut up the Ottoman Empire 
over where Palestine is, Lebanon, Syria today, was falling, and the European powers wanted those territories. And so they cut up, in a secretive agreement called Sykes-Picot, they cut up the territory and, and divided it amongst themselves, and eventually that led to the borders that we know of today in the so-called Middle East. Middle East is a reference from the European perspective, Middle of East. And I also want to point out, and I get into so much more detail in the book about it, uh, Israel. Israel is not done expanding. Israel does not tell anybody what its borders are. It may be the only nation state that I know of that has not defined its borders. It's not done expanding. What I argue about Israel's borders with Palestine, the Israel-Palestine border, because over the last 30 years there's been this impasse of a peace process that's been trying to get a so-called two-state solution with a Palestine state and an Israel state side by side, where the Palestinian leadership during the peace process has been trying to negotiate a border. And again, borders are agreements between the above so that they don't fight. What I argue is that the Israel-Palestine border already exists, but it's not on a map. It's the line between the above and the below, between the human and the non-human, the human and the so-called terrorist. That's the border between Israel-Palestine. And that's why we have an impasse. There is, no, there is not going to be a two-state solution unless there's recognition of some kind of parity. I also mention in this book how when I wrote a National Science Foundation grant for my dissertation research, I got rejected the first time, and the feedback was that my research is a threat to Eretz Israel. A threat to Eretz Israel. The only people who use that phrase, Eretz Israel, are expansionist Zionists who wish to have this geography <coughs> of Israel. And of course, I, I was upset because I needed the $10,000, right? But then I was also happy. I was like, hey, I could really explain my work all right. It is a threat to Eretz Israel, I hope. I hope. So I want to pause there. And uh, I wonder if we might turn on the lights just so that I could read. Uh, I'll read a couple of chapters, and there are some accompanying maps. So I want to read first just, just two, two entries from my diary in Palestine. And then uh, I'll read Speak of the Devil, which is the first chapter in part, uh, the part of Palestine from above. So these two entries are the last two entries in, in my diary. And, and I mentioned a friend, Rochelle. Rochelle, she was, she's Canadian, she was Mennonite, and we were totally suspicious of each other, and so we ended up becoming really good friends. <laughs> and it was really nice. She was in Palestine. It was really nice because she knew about the Bible, and I, I found myself having to read the Bible after I've been told that this is not about religion, this is totally secular in order for me to figure out how the borders of Palestine were constructed, it, they were constructed through the Bible, like in the 19th century with theologians, evangelical Christians, taking the Bible as a field guide and trying to figure out where the borders were. So then I had to like read and I had that like, you know, I could ask her questions and she didn't think I was dumb, you know, and, and it was really nice because I was afraid to insult anyone, you know, and she was totally cool about it. So. She's still a good friend, she's up in Canada. So, that's background to Rochelle. Rochelle calls her friends Shadi and Jihad to sit with us in Manger Square. Everybody owes a lot of electricity since the second intifada. Shadi mentions to us as they sit. A lot of people haven't been able to pay their electric bill. It hasn't been a problem, but recently they've begun electricity cuts. People are getting desperate and have begun selling their land, Shadi says. To other Palestinians, he clarifies. Shadi has forgotten we have met before, and Rochelle tries to help him remember. He asks what I'm doing in Palestine, and we start talking about maps. Jihad, who has up until now been sitting, smoking, uninterested, becomes interested. He has an old Greek map of Palestine, he says. 
And would I be able to read it? There's a church on that map called St. Francis that doesn't exist anymore. I ask if he can draw it, and he draws a sword pointing down with two snakes, one on each side. He also draws a triangle with a number 20 on each edge. I ask him what that is. He says he has seen it on the ground and that there are thousands all over Palestine. A survey benchmark, we together realize where surveyors stick their instruments into the ground to survey and map the land. The British colonizers did this to Palestine in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Shadi and Jihad say they can show me where they are if I want to see. Palestinians find all kinds of things they don't let foreigners know about unless they trust them. There's gold and buried treasure. They share that Palestinians find relics from the Greek and Ottoman period that they then sell to get money which they have to do since nobody can find a job. They sell the Greek artifacts to the Greeks and the Ottoman ones to the Turks, Jihad says, as part of their history. What's part of Palestinian history, I ask? All of this stuff is not Palestinian history. It's the occupier's history, says Jihad. We have been occupied by Israel, then the Romans, then the Greeks, then the Turks, then the British, and then Israel. So what would you consider Palestinian artifacts, I asked the Palestine from below? Well, just little things nobody wants to pay for. This is, this was, I couldn't believe that I was hearing what I was hearing, that there is an analysis in Palestine that we've been occupied by the above for thousands of years. There's been a blow for thousands of years the Kingdom of Israel, the Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, that's the Greeks, right? The, the Ottomans, who are the Turks, right? And then the British, and then Israel again, right? This is all history from above. Like, this, these are not Palestinian artifacts. So it, it was incredible, because I had never heard an analysis like that in the United States. Okay, so then the, this is the last, uh, so I was living in Bethlehem, right next to the Nativity Church. And, um, and I lived on Star Street, which is where the procession goes every Christmas you know, to the Nativity Church. And so this is the last entry in the diary. There is a set of identical triplets on Star Street. I learned about them when I first arrived, thinking they were twins when only two of them came into Mary's store. La, Mary had corrected me, held up three fingers, and checked each one off as she said their names. Musa, Haysa, Muhammad. Each named after a prophet of three sibling worlds, Judaism's Moses, Christianity's Jesus, Islam's Muhammad. Identical triplets, 10 years old. For almost nine months, I have lived on Star Street, and I have never once seen all three at the same time. Only two at the same time, sometimes only one. One of them, when he's by himself, always makes faces and tries to whack me. I fight back, though. But walking home on Star Street tonight, I finally encounter the Navi triplets, the prophet triplets, heading straight toward me. We are about to pass each other, and I fully expect the one who hates me to throw something at me. But he instead hands it to me. It's the flower. His name is Mohammed, he says, and we introduce ourselves. I get to meet Isa and Nar. I meet Musa and tell him Abu Josie is named Musa too, making him smile. There is another little boy there. I introduce myself. He has a name I've never heard of, and I forget it, by the way. I thank them for the flower and ask where it came from. It is Dada, they answer, the trash. I can only laugh. As I say goodnight and turn to walk home, one of the triplets picks up more flowers from the ground and throws them at me. I now know it is Isa who doesn't like me. Mohammed picks up one of the flowers Asa threw down and hands it to me. So now I have two flowers, both from Mohammed. 
I walk home delighted. I have finally seen the Navi triplets, all three prophets, all three identical, all at the same time. And more than that, Muhammad and Musa have set a better example for Isa now, inshallah. <laughs> Maybe next time we cross each other's path, Isa and I will greet each other instead of fight. <laughs> so, I, that's in the first part, and in the last part, I do like an exegesis on that story. I was like, oh my God, it does make sense, because Jesus and I have had historical tension. You know? <laughs> And Musa is the one that made things right. You know, I'm sorry, Muhammad is the one that made things right and the most mysterious to me. You know, and since then I've learned about Islam and it's been so beautiful, largely through my pompa, Muhammad Abdu, whose book is here, Islam and Anarchism, and he gave a talk here a few months back. Um, and without his work, I couldn't have written this book the way that I wrote it. Okay, so I'm gonna read now. In section two, the West, Palestine from above, the first chapter in that section, it's called Speak of the Devil. There is a saying in English for when you're speaking about someone who isn't there and they suddenly appear. Speak of the Devil. This phrase is shortened from the longer, Speak of the Devil and he shall appear. That second part is usually left out as if too much has already been spoken. In Spanish, the phrase is, speaking of the king of Rome, he'll appear by the door. Hablando del rey de Roma por la puerta soma. I can't help but to interpret this to mean that across worlds, it was previously agreed that the king of Rome was the devil or that the devil was the king of Rome. In Palestine, depending on who you ask, the devil's origins were far humbler than that. According to tradition, before he became known as the cosmic enemy of God, a figure called the Satan appears in the Bible as God's obedient servant, whose job it is to check in on people unannounced, making them pass cruel tests to confirm their devotion to God. When the Jewish people of Jesus of Nazareth organized their rebellion against the Roman Empire 2,000 years ago, they were neither the first nor the last to adopt a good versus evil binary dualism to guide their struggle. They say Christianity borrowed the binary from Manichaeanism in Persia some centuries back, but still Christianity is credited with inventing the devil in Palestine. I wonder, is this Christianity's main difference from Judaism, that Judaism interprets God as doer of both good and evil, and in Christianity, God is only doer of good, and the, do and the devil is doer of evil? Speaking of the devil, he has appeared. He is on the map on the opposite page. They say the Roman Empire reached its greatest territorial extent in the year 117 AD. This is another way of saying the Roman Empire went into decline the day after. This was almost 100 years after Rome assassinated Palestine's rebel Jesus. As the map shows, the devil used to surround all the Mediterranean Sea and its adjacent lands, including North Africa, the Iberian Peninsula, and the Balkan Peninsula, all the way to Jerusalem. It would still be 200 years before the devil would be baptized as Christian, his second greatest trick, crucial for his first. By then, the Roman emperor almost had no choice but to co-opt the resistance. The word of the rebel Jesus was spreading widely along the Mediterranean peninsulas and forts, all the way from Jerusalem. Rome's capture of Christianity granted it legitimacy to determine who was the devil now, and it wasn't going to be the king of Rome. Not in official history, capital H. The emperor could now label his enemy the devil to deflect attention from himself. Black Africans, indigenous peoples, women, Jews, Muslims, pagans, other Christians against the empire were called the devil by Rome. A baptism that transformed Christianity from a religion of the earth into a religion of the empire. 
There still exist today many Christianities from below, both from above, both from before and from after. But the health of the resistances to the capture has been weak. Christianity has not been the only world captured. The kingdom of Israel captured Judaism in the past, and the state of Israel has captured Judaism again in the present. Caliphs, kings, sultans, and ayatollahs have captured Islam in the past and continue holding Islam captive in the present. Christianity's capture has an official date and event, 312 AD, the day Roman Emperor Constantine was baptized in the city he would soon name after himself, Constantinople. The acronym AD in all of this means Anno Domini Nostri Jesu Christi, meaning after the birth of the year of our Lord Jesus Christ. This notation is used today by a global empire that calls itself secular, meaning not religious. Secular is a word that helps the devil pull off his greatest trick, getting everyone to believe he doesn't exist where he actually exists. For the years before the birth of Christ, the traditional notation is before Christ, BC. Its secularized notation is before Common Era, BCE. And AD is secularized as CE, Common Era. But not everybody uses a secularized notation. And there's no secularizing that the birth of Christ remains empire's year zero. That's not every, every world's year zero. In the Jewish calendar, year zero is from the creation of the world according to Jewish tradition, almost 4,000 years before Europe's year zero. Islam's year zero comes 622 years after Europe's, that is 622 AD, the year of the Hijrah, the journey the Prophet Muhammad and his followers took from Mecca to Medina. Year zero for the Maya is the domestication of maize in one of the calendars while events millions of years from before and after are counted in the other Maya calendars. Empires, secular or not, regularly capture the resistance from below to co-opt it, to neutralize it. Too often they succeed. Death and destruction are not easy to resist. Neither are the devil's seductions. 300 years after Christianity's capture, Islam would be born on the Iberi in the Arabian Peninsula, spreading quickly up to Jerusalem and throughout Rome's territories. Understandably, this upset the Roman Empire, less because it was Christian, more because it was an empire, one challenged by other empires similarly familiar with the power of capture. Notice Granada on the map. After losing Jerusalem, a wounded and dangerous Rome launched holy wars to reconquer the holy city. Known as the Crusades, the best known of these took place between 1095 to 1291 AD, resulting in the brief retaking of Jerusalem. Crusading is said to mark the early unification of modern Europe, a geography usually at war with itself, absent an external enemy absent an external devil. Many crusaders were recruited to do Europe's fighting with promises of God's salvation. Others were motivated by economic and political temptations. All were told by Rome that the devil was Islam, continuing to pull off its greatest trick, getting everyone to believe the devil does not exist where he actually exists. So, I, what I try to do in this book is to point to empire as the devil through what Christian anarchists and Marxists taught me in Palestine. And it's not just Europe, it's not just Rome, it's all empires. All empires who seek to capture energy and impose one, one way on others. So the Ottoman Empire also takes a hit here. And this is really important because in today's world where the so-called left, well, the left from above, wants to impose a multipolar world where many empires exist, 
there is a discourse that the West is the problem and the East is the solution. And so then the rest of us, Abiyala, Africa, we're just like, you know, background players in their cosmic war of East and West. And so that's the importance of the Fourth World War. And this is something that in Palestine on the ground, especially after October 7th, the compas in the camps were telling me, this is not, this is not just Zionism, that's the problem. This is not just Europe, that's the problem. This is not just the West, that's the problem. Because what we have all seen, we've been paying attention, is that there has been a split revealed between those above and those below. Islam from above, Islam from below. And we see this from, like, for example, the regimes. Saudi Arabia, who's the leader, who's supposed to be the spiritual leader of Islam in the world, was getting together and normalizing Israel on the eve of October 7th. And I, I received a phone call two weeks before October 7th when Netanyahu gave a speech at the United Nations and showed that map of Israel with no Palestine and then how you know, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Egypt, all of the regimes around it in the south were normalizing Israel. And the phone call that I received from Palestine the day after that was that the struggle is over. It's done the minute Saudi Arabia normalizes Israel, Palestine is done, completely done. So there is an analysis on the ground in Palestine that there is a split of above and below and it's global. It's not just Zionism that's the problem. It's not just the West that the problem is the global problem. So this is what I'm also intervening in through, through this writing. So I wanna be clear, <laughs> I'm not just talking about the Roman Empire, I'm talking about empire. And so I talk a lot about that throughout the book and try to tease that out. The next chapter is called Wounded Europe, which um, was for me something really important. And when I went to Europe uh, in 2021, to, uh, to follow the Zapatistas there, I realized there's a Europe from below too. There's not just a Europe from above and it's all homogenous and they're all assholes, right? So I'll just read like the first line of that one. Well, the first two lines. I think it's called Wounded Europe because I really go in on Europe. I begin this chapter by clarifying right away that there exists a Europe that isn't an asshole. I met that land briefly some years back. It has a different name though. Slumir Kashk and Kop in Mayan Sotil, meaning Tierra Insumisa in Spanish, rebellious land in English. That's what it was baptized as by the Zapatistas, rebellious land. Like, and they showed me, oh, there's a girl from below. This, this, it was really liberating to see, even if it's of course small. Like, here also, there's a United States from below, like a lot of people outside, like, you know, family in the South, they don't want to come to the US because they're like, no, I'm not going to go visit the empire, you know, or like colleagues, compas, and then they come and they see that there's struggle here too, right? So there's like a complication. There's a US from above and a US from below as well. And that's the case in Europe as well. Okay, so I'm gonna, now, I'm only going to read uh, two more. I'm going to just one more. Now, I'm going to read two more. And this is now skipping forward to um, the end. And it is called, uh, this is chapter 18. There's 20 chapters. And um, each chapter has a Maya Nawal energy sign. Um, and so there's kind of like a little prayer embedded in the chapters that only I know of and try to go to because we both study and others who study with us too. Um, but I'm happy to talk about them another time because it could be an entire other talk about the Maya, Maya philosophy in this book. But I'll just read part of side by side and then we'll read one more chapter and then we'll pause and if we can talk. Sound good? Side by side. Soon, so side by side is the antidote to above and below, the serenity, right? Above and below is where power is circulated hierarchically, and side by side is where it's in a circulated in a more dispersed fashion. 
And of course, there's still structure. There has to be structure in order for power to circulate the ways that we want it. It's not structureless. It's just that this structure is one that favors sociopathy, the lack of empathy, individualism, cannibalism, as the elders call it, with Columbus and other cannibals by Jack Ford, right? It rewards you going above at the expense of others below. It rewards us all the time, right? And so that's, that's to me, this is what I'm calling the devil in the book. This is the logic and practice of empire. No matter what its face, no matter what its name, if the logic and practice is this, right? And we get tricked all the time when the devil changes its face. The, the Zapatistas who don't use this term, the devil. I'm just using it for this book because I'm like, but when I realized that Jesus was fighting the Roman Empire and that Christianity is given credit for inventing the devil, right? It, it was really helpful like in marking something for me. Uh, so, so above and below is the first chapter of the last section that talks about the circulation of power in that way. The next chapter after that is called Side by Side. Soon after being purged from the nation of Islam for being a truth teller, Malcolm X borrowed money from his sister and traveled to Africa and the Middle East in 1964. For what would be the final year of his life, he came back reporting that, quote, travel broadens your scope. Sharing in speeches and interviews his learnings about anti-colonial struggles outside the United States, the place he knew best. While visiting Mecca, while visiting Mecca in pilgrimage as a Muslim, Malcolm received the Arabic name El Hajj Malik Ishabaz. While visiting newly independent Nigeria to deliver a speech, he received the Yoruba name Omowale meaning the son who has come home. While in newly independent Ghana, he met the ambassador to the newly independent Algeria and refined his analysis on whiteness. To the Algerian ambassador, he had shared his worldview of black nationalism before realizing the Algerian ambassador, a revolutionary, was white. Of this encounter, Omar Wale, El Hajj Malik Shabazz, Malcolm X, shared the following. When I was in Africa in May, in Ghana, I was speaking with the Algerian ambassador, who is extremely militant and is a revolutionary in the true sense of the word, and has his credentials as such for having carried on a successful revolution against oppression in his country. When I told him that my political, social, and economic philosophy was black nationalism, he asked me very frankly, well, where did that leave him? Because he was white. He was an African, but he was Algerian, and to all appearances, he was a white man. And he said, if I define my objective as the victory of black nationalism, where does that leave him? Where does that leave revolutionaries in Morocco, Egypt, Iraq, Mauritania? So he showed me where I was alienating people who were true revolutionaries dedicated to overthrowing the system's exploitation that exists on this earth by any means necessary. So I had to do a lot of thinking and reappraising of my definition of black nationalism. Can we sum up the solution to the problems confronting our people as black nationalism? And if you notice, I haven't been using that expression for several months but I still would be hard pressed to give a specific definition of the overall philosophy which I think is necessary for the liberation of the black people in this country. And that's the end of this quote. In another speech delivered only hours after his house was firebombed on February 14, 1965, and only a week before his ultimate assassination, Omawale El Hajj Malik Shabazz Malcolm X again reported back on worlds where people are white only quote unquote incidentally, where white does not mean they're the boss, where white was only a description, an adjective, not a noun. In the dominant world, far more global today than during the time of Omolade and Hajmanika Shabazz Malcolm X, 
white adjective continues to be entangled into white noun, beings designated superior within a world structure of superior versus inferior, against beings who are black adjective, against beings marked as black noun. White adjective versus black adjective. White noun and black noun together, but above versus below, not side by side. White supremacy and anti-blackness together, two poles of the dominant world, two poles of the world of 1492, two poles of the world even before, of Asia's world even before. Not the same as human versus non-human. White versus black is human versus anti-human. Omawale and Haj Malik Shabazz, Malcolm X, didn't get to live long enough to develop his overall philosophy. I wonder how much more healing there might have been on earth had he not been martyred when he was. I wonder who are the ones taking up the project he left behind. I wonder if maybe we all should be taking up the project he left behind. Liberation, after all, is what's at stake. Is the task of white people, white capital W, is the task of white people, is the task of the ones who believe they're the boss because they're incidentally white, is the task of white people to split apart white adjective from white noun? Is it the task of white people? Is it the task of the ones who want neither the privilege nor the sociopathy? Is it the task of revolutionary white people to split apart their incidental whiteness from white, I'm the boss? Can the two split? For a world where all the worlds fit, they must be split. How can they be split? And after the split, after white adjectives escape, how might white adjective evade recapture into white noun? The seductions to remain captive are great. Captive to privilege, captive to sociopathy, captive to empire, and everybody knows the devil's seductions to stay captive are great. I have heard white adjective people refuse the label white and think it's enough while the world continues treating them as white, while the hospitals, the schools, the workplaces, the courts, the prisons, the state, not only see them as white, they treat them as white. And where everyday people too also treat them as white. One cannot say they are not white, capital W, when the world treats them as white, whether one likes it or not. The world thus itself is a problem. It is a problem of the world. It is a problem of an anti-black world. It is a problem of a system structured by domination, by above versus below, making it difficult for us to share the world together, side by side, by side by side. After that, then I go into uh, the conceptual curanderismo, the healing that Silvia Michael is a Mexican intellectual who's also Palestinian, and she's an intellectual that rocks with the Zapatistas all the time. She studies Mesoamerican philosophy, how she taught me about side by side, together side by side, that's how Zapatista women want to struggle with the men, is not to be above below and like switch the positions of domination, not to exclude the men, but to be together with the men side by side. And in a fluid, complementary dualism rather than a binary, hierarchical dualism. And that to me was like, whoa, like you just opened up a whole world for me that we can have dualisms in a different way. That difference can be related to in a respectful way rather than one that's competitive, that wants to annihilate difference. And in fact, what the Zapatista women say is, we are equal because we're different. There isn't a standard for equality like with citizenship. Citizenship is a standard you have to meet in order to have rights. When you begin that, you're equal because you're different, there's no standard, and it's difference that's our power rather than our weakness, right? We're powerful because of our difference, not in spite of our difference, whereas with 
something like citizenship with rights, once you introduce a standard for anything, you immediately introduce inequality. You begin with the assumption that you're not equal, and now you have to reach the standard, right? And that's not just citizenship, it's also beauty standards, education standards, like all the standards of everyday life that we get taught since we're tiny in the womb and get reinforced in school, get reinforced in everyday life by the media, that there is a standard, whether it's citizenship, intelligence, beauty, work, all of that. So that's the chapter side by side. I go into more, I go into how I learned from Sylvia. Like, like where does this wisdom come from? She's like, it's in nature, you know? And so I, I learned from, I went to the Zapatista Little School where we got to live with the Zapatistas for a week. And I learned there that, you know, they fed me, they sheltered me, everything. They, they showed us their autonomous schools, their autonomous clinics, their cooperative. They gave us textbooks to read about how they do autonomous governance, how women participate. And I'm there and I'm like mapping out how I live my life and how I have to pay for everything in order to live. I have to buy it. Absent land, we have to buy everything. And I'm in Chiapas on the hammock reading their textbooks and I'm like, I'm anti-capitalist, but I can't live without capitalism. I need to learn how to live without capitalism if I'm truly gonna be anti-capitalist. Like how can we be anti-something that we're so dependent on, right? And so then I started then to at least try to learn how to grow food, like to even just you know, respect that work. Because I come from Oxnard, which is an industrial agricultural place where everyone tells the kid, do not work in the fields, go study instead. So like the, the land, the earth is something bad because it's so exploitative. And we start confusing the land with the exploitation. So we don't want to be with the land. So then I had to come back to the land. I started learning how to grow milpa, which is the three sisters, the, the corn, the beans, and the squash. And I talk about how they're all different plants, but they use their superpowers together to create this really beautiful garden. Whereas like in Oxnard or in agricultural fields, you just see sameness. One crop and it has to look the same. And it's, everything is cited, pesticided, insecticided, excited. Difference has to be annihilated in order for the plant to live. So that you see the philosophy of the world we live in through the ways that we acquire food and many other things, yeah. Okay, so I'll read the last bit. It's called strategy and tactics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's a preview, check it over here. Okay. I love this chapter so much. I'm glad you like it too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sun Tzu's The Art of War, a text written roughly 2,500 years ago, was traditionally kept secret among the generals and the kings who didn't want the soldiers studying strategy. The soldiers might overthrow the generals and the kings. Soldiers were trained only in tactics, meaning they were never trained at reading and managing the bigger fire, yeah. only at starting fires, putting out fires, and reporting there's a fire. Today, the art of war is widely available, but few seem to read it outside business schools, corporate boardrooms, and the business section of the bookstore, as if more evidence were needed that capital is war. It's important to note, The Art of War is a book about a specific type of strategy, military strategy, the zero-sum game of win or die. Reading it can turn your stomach when you realize the enemy it's talking about is you, your family, your community, your world, your planet Earth. The challenge when studying military strategy is to learn to defend ourselves by not becoming the monsters that we fight. To study strategy beyond the military type of above versus below and study how to circulate power side by side, all while respecting our differences in both collective and individual forms. That is, all while building the world anew as we fight off the old, both and at the same time. The ethics of who we wish to become while in war may be why we need strategy the most. Bear survival pits us against each other, and without strategy, there's always a fight. Never a question of how to fight, 
when to fight or if to fight. Without strategy, it's just constant fights. Sun Tzu. To win 100 victories in 100 battles is not the acme of skill. To subdue the enemy without fighting is the acme of skill. An old mentor used to tell us, our task is not to express our outrage. Our task is to organize against the source of our outrage. Organizing requires strategy. Mobilizing can be a tactic of a strategy, but mobilizing is not a strategy. Mobilizing is not the same as organizing. Mobilizing without organizing is just constant fights. Still left to address. How do we organize without expressing our outrage? Something that also needs to be addressed. How do we fight off the one that calls us enemy while our ability to survive depends on it? Over to questions of when. When to fight, when not to fight. When to pull resources from the one we fight. When do we reduce harm inside the one we fight? When do we subvert and inspire hearts inside the one we fight? Back to questions of how. How do we prevent being captured by it? How do we engage it without legitimizing it? How do we stay guided by a strategy outside it? How do we ensure we do not become it? In Guerrilla Warfare, written in 1961, Che Guevara teaches about the difference between strategy and tactics. He begins the section, Guerrilla Strategy, with the following line. In guerrilla terminology, strategy is understood as the analysis of the objectives to be achieved in the light of the total military situation and the overall ways of reaching those objectives. To have a correct strategic appreciation from the point of view of the guerrilla band, it is necessary to analyze fundamentally what will be the enemy's mode of action. He begins a section on guerrilla tactics with, in military language, tactics are the practical method of achieving the grand strategic objectives. In one sense, they complement strategy, and in another, there are more specific rules within it. As means, tactics are much more variable, much more flexible than the final objectives and they should be adjusted continually during the struggle. There are tactical objectives that remain constant throughout a war and others that vary. The first thing to be considered is the adjusting of guerrilla action to the action of the enemy. So you've got to be able to read the enemy. Right? Strategy requires analysis and a bigger objective outside and separate from the enemy's objective. Strategy analyzes the enemy's mode of action. Tactics adjust to it. Strategy requires reading what the enemy is doing in order to manage the fire. At their best, tactics alone can put out small fires or start small fires. At their worst, tactics alone report over and over that there's a fire, there's a fire, there's another fire. Chess is a game of war. I know the theory behind it enough to say something about it, but I don't like to play it. I don't like how I feel when I play it. I don't even know if I would be good at it. I didn't even know a chessboard could be sideways until a friend pointed out my chessboards in this book were sideways. <laughs> They're fixed now. I only know enough about chess to critique it, but not because it requires critique but because the way people talk about chess requires critique. People seem to believe the chessboard is the only nature of the world, the only possible configuration of the world. Chess is a two-player war game where both sides begin with the same military formation and resources. In chess, each side shares the same competing goal to capture the other side's king. The loss of the king entails the loss of the game. With stakes that straightforward, everyone on the chessboard is expected to perish on behalf of the king if needed, 
including the queen, the piece with the most capacity, even more capacity than the king. The capacity of each piece is measured by its mobility. The queen possesses the most mobility. The queen possesses the most mobility, able to move any number of squares vertically, horizontally, or diagonally, both backwards and forwards, combining the powers of the bishop, which can move diagonally back and forth, and the rook, which can move vertically and horizontally back and forth. The queen does not possess the power of the knight, the only piece that can jump. The king can move in any direction, but only one square at a time, and also cannot jump. They say the queen herself is a new piece on the board. In this more than 1400 year old game from the lands called India and Persia, the queen is said to have appeared on European chess boards only 500 years ago. Replacing the king's advisor, the vizier, with a piece inspired by Queen Isabella of Castile. I have citations too, like if y'all don't believe me. <laughs> <laughs> they say the chessboard hasn't changed since then. How, about how change takes place, in guerrilla warfare, Che Guevara wrote, it is not necessary to wait until all conditions for making revolution exist the insurrection can create them. Guerrilla warfare is a strategy for how a smaller force from below can be the conventional army from above. The heroes in guerrilla chess would be the pawns, the least powerful, the anonymous front line, the ones sent out first to fight and first to die, the disposable one, the least valuable one, the ones not even referred to as pieces, only as pawns. The pawns can move only one square, two squares if it's their first move, and only forwards. The pawns cannot retreat, and pawns cannot jump. They capture only on the diagonal, one square at a time. I once designed a graduate seminar called Space and Capital, where I assigned my students something I'd been wanting to read. Gilles Deleuze and Félix Guattari's writings on war. Anarchist philosophers from France who I don't know if they call themselves that. In A Thousand Plateaus, published in 1980, in the chapter Nomadology, The War Machine, Deleuze and Guattari compare chess, a tactics game, with a strategy game from China called Go, a game older than chess and even as old as the art of war. In Go, the goal is not to capture the king, but to capture territory. In Go, there is no king. All pieces in Go have the same powers and anonymous identity, reminiscent of the pawn. Identity, value, and rank does not exist in Go the way it does in chess. As Deleuze and Guattari put it, chess is a game of state or of the court. The emperor of China played it. Chess pieces are coded. They have an internal nature and intrinsic properties from which their movements, situations, and confrontations derive. They have qualities. A knight remains a knight, a pawn a pawn, a bishop a bishop. Go pieces, in contrast, are pellet, discs, simple arithmetic units, and have only an anonymous collective or third person function. It makes a move. It could be a man, a woman, a louse, an elephant. Go pieces are elements of a non-subjectified machine assemblage with no intrinsic properties, only situational ones. Thus, the relations are very different in the two cases. Before Deleuze and Guattari, I had never heard of Go. Has anyone here heard of Go? Yeah, everyone. Oh, I just I had no idea what Go was. That's cool. <laughs> For the rest of the semester, I wish I would have known y'all back then because I spent the whole semester asking if anyone could teach me. Mm -hmm. For the rest of the semester, I asked around if anyone knew how to play, but almost nobody had heard of Go. I was at Brown University and nobody had heard of Go. 
One day, I asked my neighbor across the hall, who I hadn't known before, sharing about Duos and Guitari and the war machine. He said he didn't know about Go, but that one of our neighbors in the same building was a chess teacher, and he might know. The chess teacher turned out to be the under 10 world youth chess champion in 1988, <laughs> who had beat Bobby Fischer three times, he said, and he had never heard of Go. He also turned out to be a Palestinian man my age, fluent in Spanish, born and raised in the Maya world, father from Haifa, mother from Bethlehem. I asked if he had been. He said no. I sensed he wasn't used to talking about Palestine, so I didn't ask that much anymore. Much later, he would share that long ago, he had wanted to compete under the Palestinian flag in world chess, but had been forbidden by forces both from above and from below. He looked up Go and became curious about it too. We couldn't find anyone with a board, so we played on a tablet and let the computer inform us when we did something wrong. I can't remember if he beat me every time. We stopped playing the day I made a single move that made the computer flash the board several times, announcing I had just won and the game was over. We could only stare at the board. Maybe it was what Deleuze and Atari had written about, quote, all by itself, a Go piece can destroy an entire constellation synchronically. A chess piece cannot. Sometime later, I came across an illustration from a series, La Vida en Ajedrez, Life in Chess. It showed four rows of pawns against one row of pieces with no pawns protecting any of the pieces. The artist, Eduardo Salles, had entitled the illustration Revolucion, revolution. I wondered the backstory. How had the pawns recruited more pawns to become 32? Had the other side's pawns been convinced to switch sides? I played the artist's rendering in real life using only legal moves and found it was true. 32 pawns on a chessboard can overpower the pieces and capture the king not by changing the power of the pawn, but by changing their relationship to the pieces and by changing their relationship to each other. In order to win, the pawns must stay close together, keeping each other safe while moving forward, knowing some will likely be sacrificed. Still, while the odds are good, winning is not a guarantee. The sides must be kept closed off so a piece like the queen can't take them out from behind. The other day, I called my old neighbor to get his assessment on whether the 32 pawns can win. His answer was that my chess boards were sideways. They're fixed now. I thought he might remark on why my pawns were different colors, but he didn't. I thought he might be insulted I had changed the sacred chess board. He wasn't. He later showed me online drills he gives his students that change the board all the time, including a well-known chess formation with 36 pawns called Horde. Since white always makes the first move in chess, I asked him if it will make a difference if the pieces are white instead of black, and that the pawns are black instead of white. He ignored my question and shared a story of a student who asked him if it was racist that white always goes first in chess. He said he could only laugh not knowing what to say. I said I wouldn't be surprised with Isabella of Thayer's queen. After inspecting the rest of the board, he confirmed the 32 pawns can overcome the pieces and take the king, as long as they stay close together and keep the sides closed off from the queen. To statistically confirm, he logged on to lightchess.org, an open source chess platform. I noticed his username had next to it an icon of Earth and a Palestinian flag. They say the chessboard hasn't changed in 500 years. If it's true, it's not necessary to wait for the conditions to change as Che Guevara taught. 
that the insurrection can create the conditions, then what if the pawns change the chessboard's conditions? What if the least powerful, the anonymous front lines, the ones sent out first to fight and first to die, the disposable ones, the least valuable ones, change the conditions? What if the ones below could change the landscape of battle by changing their relationship to the above, by changing their relationship to each other? during the 80s, 
you know, he was suppressed. And now he's like uh, the owner of the franchise of, uh, you know, uh, McDonald's in South Africa, as for example. So there are people from the oppressed groups that uh, uh, collaborate and they get social mobility to collaborate with, with imperialism from the ones uh, above, uh, on top. And, uh, uh, well, I'm going to leave it from now, you know, I would like to your opinion. Yeah. Yes, the whole book is about what you just said about the intermediary class. I don't really use the word class, but you just reminded me I didn't read the chapter on capital, so I'll just explain that part, if that's okay. So the whole book, when talking about empire and the above and below, is that it's a closed system where the only option for survival is to go above. Right? And it's not binary. Like the world is not binary, even if the concept is binary. Which is why, like, for example, it's important to understand that people of color in a non in a white supremacist world is not specific enough to have us understand that the other polarity of white supremacy is anti-blackness. So non-black people of color are those intermediaries. Like there's a model minority as Asians are called, right? Like immigrants in this country constantly try to be away, stay away from black people to show that they're quote unquote hard workers, not criminals, which is all anti-black code, like that we're not black. So brown people, so-called Latinos, and I talk about this in the, in the chapter uh, downward assimilation, which is this term sociologists have for those of us who are children of new immigrants, by which they mean the non-European, mm -hmm. who share our lives and fates with black people. That we're downward assimilating. We're not assimilating up. We're staying down below. So this whole, this whole framework is precisely about competing with each other, trying to be at the top. And if you can't be white, then at least don't be black. This is an intermediary position for people of color who are not black, right? That's the last chapter where I talk about that. The, and you know, the, the, the point of the book is to try to map out an exit. Instead of trying to assimilate into the above in order to survive, we need to escape to another world where all the worlds fit, where power circulates differently. And that's the importance of strategy and tactics. The outside is the strategy. If we don't have an outside, we don't have a strategy. We have to have an outside of empire. And I have many of these lessons from Palestine, Palestine itself. In Palestine, I was asked by Palestinians, because I would talk a lot about the Zapatistas, if I could talk more about how the Zapatistas use international law, for example. And they asked me to write an essay about it in the Deal magazine, which is a refugee magazine, and it's available freely, it's called Law as Tactic. And the whole point is that when the Zapatistas use international law, they don't use it to say that international law is gonna give them autonomy. They use it as an obstacle so that the Mexican government won't attack them, but they're gonna create their own autonomy. They have a strategy outside of empire. International law is part of an institution of empire. International law created the problem of Palestine in the first place in 1947, right? And so it's a huge paradox of when do we use it, when do we not use it, right? And so much of the discourse is about human rights, human rights, international law, but there's no strategy outside of empire. It's about getting the above to recognize that you're human, that you deserve a place in the world, and that is Zionism. Zionism is the wretched of the, of the earth, the below, seeking protection from the above. And in order to do that, they've had to create another below, which is Palestinians. And it's not just Zionism, but that's like probably like the most exemplary case. All of us, if we're given this option, who would say no when the world is closed like that? And that's the importance of learning there are other worlds that still exist, there are other possible worlds, and the strategy has to be creating that world, and while we're still under the domination of this overwhelming dominant world, so how do we do that in their strategy and tactic? When do we go into the dominant world to pull out resources? When do we go in to subvert? When do we go in to reduce harm? 
Those are all tactical questions from the perspective of an outside. But the outside is the other world, not the one that's enclosed in it. So yeah, as long as the world in our conception and our practice is closed, where there's only those positions of you're either above or you're below, there's always going to be an intermediary class. There's always going to be how Fanon told us about the national bourgeoisie, the so-called post-colonial condition has been that the oppressor's face now looks like ours. Confusing everything, right? But the logic and the practice is still there. That's what I mean about how the devil changes face. The Zapatistas call it the capitalist hydra. A hydra, you cut off one head, another one grows, usually the one to your own desire, and it confuses things. So this is very common throughout the dominant world, and we're stuck. And so then what happens a lot of the time, and, and in Palestine, this is the case too, where the Palestinian leadership, largely educated in the West, wants the West to love Palestine, and so they compete against who's more deserving, Israelis or Palestinians, right? And so it's this constant fight over who's gonna be loved by the above. And so it's complete trap, and that happens to all of our movements unless we have a conception that we need to have strategy outside of empire. And we need to figure out how we're going to escape, and not only that, how we're not gonna get captured again. This logic at its base is master-slave dialectic. The master is a master only because the master has a slave. The slave runs away, there's no more master. So the master is committed to recapturing the slave in order to be master still, right? If we could just be committed to not being a master, just being a person, right? We don't need to recapture the slave. We don't have to have a below. We could just be side by side by side. But as long as there is a commitment to be superior, then there's going to be this recapture, this violence, this death, this destruction, this genocide in the case of colonialism of Palestine, etc. So yeah, so to then your question of class, I didn't read the chapter on capital, but I could just briefly, because it's almost eight o'clock, I don't know if we want to stay, but basically, usually when we hear about an anti-capitalist politics, <coughs> by the traditional Marxist left, you know, there's a lot of different Marxisms, like I said, there's a Marxism from above, Marxism from below, right? But like the dominant one, the loudest one, that we hear talks about the dialectic, the fight between the boss and the worker. And that the problem of capitalism is that the boss keeps siphoning off surplus value, the labor of the worker, and not giving the worker all their labor value, right? So the boss gets rich from the work of the worker. And so then there's like this whole move, well, we need to build cooperatives then, so there's no boss, right? And so then the workers can have the share of the profit. I feel like I should read that chapter, but it's kind of late. But I hope that you like it. It's called Capital. The books are there. Yeah, the books are there. Um, no, I spoke that <laughs> And so what I show, which is not just me, but it's, a, it's Native, Native American philosophy theory that shows that that's an incredibly limited understanding of capital. And I illustrated in the book by talking about an example. Let's say we are part of a cooperative, right? And I make paper and you make pencils. And now we try and figure out how we're gonna exchange. And under capital, it's, there's, a, there's, a, there's an equivalency that's needed in terms of how much the value is in terms of an exchange value with something else. And so usually that's labor time. So how long did it take you to, to create five pencils? How long did it take me to create a round paper, and let's say it's an hour for an hour, so we trade an hour for your hour, right? And now you have paper, and now I have pencils. There are assumptions there that go unsaid, but we learn from somewhere. One is that you and I are equal. Your hour and my hour are equal. Two, you and I are property owners. You own the paper, that the, the pencils that you make, and I own the paper that I make. Three, we can engage in contracts. We can switch the transfer of ownership and not call police and not say someone stole, etc. Okay? Basic assumptions. This is this is liberalism. This is liberalism based on individual rights. 
What's assumed there is that the tree has zero say in any of it. To make paper and pencils, we require a tree. We didn't ask the tree, can we cut you down? We didn't ask the tree, how long did it take you to create yourself? And how could we? Because what makes a tree a tree? Soil microbes make a tree. Wind pollination makes a tree. Water makes a tree. The sun makes a tree. There is a lot of work that goes on into creating energy, into creating the world that is not compensated under capital. And it's not even understood as compensatable under that framework of worker boss is the fight. The worker boss, the, the wage worker is similar to the boss in that they both have rights, right? Like the worker and the boss are similar in that they're both property owners. The worker is the property owner of their own labor that they get to sell. That's the difference between slavery. And this is where a lot of the Marxists from above, the anti-capitalism from above miss race, racialization, and the earth. Because they don't have a way to talk about how it's still capitalism if we have a worker co-op, if we're ravaging from the earth energy in order to take a profit. Profit under capitalism is the sucking of energy to accumulate it and concentrate it. If we were to compensate the tree, there would be no profit. It would just go back. Would go, the energy would go back into balance. This whole thing, capitalism is about the, a hyper imbalance of the earth, of above, below, rather than balance in terms of how energy is flowing. So this is why like, with class, class is so limited in the ways that we're usually taught by the loudest voices against capitalism, because it makes it seem as if capitalism is whatever it is that the capitalists want and the capitalist is the bad guy rather than seeing it as a structure, rather than seeing it as a logic and a practice of extraction still. And so like presidents like Evo Morales, who's indigenous, is still extractivist, right? And a lot of the left wants to support him just because he's indigenous. This is the capitalist hydra, right? A lot of the, like in Venezuela, like this is a, re like bricks, bricks are organizing to be a counter to US-led empire through dollar empire by creating another currency that's based off of commodities. Where are those commodities coming from? The extraction of the earth. So there's still, so there's like a lot of celebration among the loud left from above about the BRICS, for example, that they're gonna like be competitors to NATO, to US dollar empire, but what they're doing is that there's still that there's zero critique of the ravaging of the earth, of climate and ecological collapse, and that's the fourth world war. That's the truth of the fourth world war, is that everybody from above has signed up for capital. And what they're doing is just fighting over who's gonna have more, who's gonna have power. They're not fighting to undo it. They have zero answers to what are we gonna do about ecological collapse. They have zero answers for the next generation. It's constantly about accumulating power, accumulating power, and it's so misguided for the left. Although like in this book, I'm about to, I have friends who say that like, they don't even use the word left anymore because it's so loaded. And I think that in this book, I kind of like, I kind of retire that word for myself, even though I want to still, I want to have a word where we have an above and a below but just because you're below doesn't mean that you're about justice, about liberation. Most of the time, it means you want to be like the above, a reactionary below. So we need to have a, a way to talk about the below. The Zapatistas say from below into the left, and for them, left is very specific. It's a position, a posture, an ethical posture against injustice, against domination. But the way the left, that word is used by so many, it's to mean like a political party, it's to mean that you've read Marx and that's it, you know, or it's, it's to mean anything that you want in terms of justice without actually talking about what we mean by justice, right? So I don't wanna give up on the word left, although I think that maybe I have to because even the word like Democrats 
are understood as loved, you know, and like, you know, you, you can, it's maddening, it's maddening, and you know, I can shout all I want, but that's not what love means, except that that is what love means to many people, and so I can't deny that, right? So that's why it's important that we talk about how we're using words, what they mean, rather than just relying on the words that we're using and think that everyone's understanding everybody, you know. So that's the section on capital. Capital is really a, like, it, it's a pretty, I've heard from Compas who proofread it, it's a devastating chapter because now you can't see the world different after that. When you start thinking, what about the tree? What about the tree, right? Rather than just what about the worker and what about the boss? Worker and boss are rights bearing subjects, which means that they are considered human to the non-human below. The non-human is just resources, extraction resources in order to enrich the above. So that's why it's so important like when we're talking about capitalism and an anti-capitalist politics that we ask what about the tree? And we also ask not just about the human and the non-human, but the human and the anti-human. Because the non-human, the tree, can still be protected under eco-fascism, the tree would be protected, but who would not be protected is those who are not understood at the realm of human vis-a-vis -vis white supremacy, for example, right now. It doesn't have to be white, but right now that's what it is. And so we have this whole discourse of overpopulation as the problem of global warming. And I talk about it in this book. I went to business school, so I talk a lot about this book like in the 90s when globalization and all of that was growing. And we were just learning about globalization as the answer for everything, which meant exporting jobs to China or to Mexico. But at the same time, we were learning globalization was not sustainable because in order for everybody to live like the United States, we would need four Earths. That statistic is today five Earths. And so instead of seeking to dismantle capitalism that ravages the Earth, what eco, the eco-fascist position is to say that there's just too many people on Earth. So there's surplus populations, which even makes more sense with automation, because now with automation, people are needed less and less to be protected for their labor. They're not even necessary anymore. And Gaza, Palestine, is usually, the Gaza specifically, is the poster child for overpopulation in this discord. That has nothing to do with climate collapse. It's just a lot of brown people that are undesirable for that discourse. I've seen this in talks like on climate talks and community, et cetera. I remember at Ventura College, there was one in 2017, and there was a speaker talking about, oh, there's a really great website, everyone should check it out, I learn a lot about climate change. And I go, and they're talking about overpopulation, and the poster child, the photo, is a little baby in Gaza named Walid, who was the, the two millionth person born in the Gaza Strip, something like that. And I'm like, what does Gaza have anything to do, right? But that's the position. When we can't even imagine the end of capitalism, like that saying goes, we can imagine the end of the earth first before we can imagine the end of capital. That comes from a position of people who are completely dependent <laughs> on capital to live. They have no idea how to live with the earth. And that's most of us in cities because we've been so removed from the land. Like if we think about how I was doing in Escuelita, going through my mind and creating a mental map of how I even get my shelter, my water, my food, my anything, I have to pay for it. I don't even know where water comes from. I don't even know where my food comes from, the grocery store, right? Like, and that is the kind of consciousness then that creates this idea that we're just gonna give up on the earth because we don't see a way out. We can't even imagine the end of capitalism. We're just gonna give up and say it's gonna be the end of the earth first before it's the end of capitalism. So that's the chapter on capitalism. I hopefully destroy everything that the left from above likes to, because they need to see the below, the foundation that they're on. And that's the death and destruction that continues the world as it is and is leading to this ecological collapse and this question of borders is gonna be even more important 
in this generation because there's an estimated 1 billion climate refugees in the year 2050 because Earth is becoming uninhabitable, several parts. So that's why you're seeing the fortification of border walls, this discourse in the United States, anti-immigrant discourse, rather, you know, and the fascists, the thing about fascism, this book talks a lot about fascism, fascists are people with legitimate grievances, they're real, except that they point their ire at the most vulnerable rather than at the system. Why? Those from above do that for them, right? That's what we're seeing, and that's why it's so important to not vilify, not vilify people as good guys versus bad guys, but to understand why these decisions are being made. That way we can intervene at the root. That's what being radical is, intervening at the root rather than just slogans, rather than just talking shit and calling people names. We need to understand why people make decisions. And for me, it's helpful to understand myself that I would probably be these people if I was in their context too. I have been these people. I was an intern in Congress. I was a big fat Democrat with a capital D, right? Until I started learning things. And that's how I can see myself in a so-called enemy because depending on what you learn, how you grew up with, what you see, I always thought of myself as a good person. These people think of themselves as good, as good people most of the time, right? And that's why I insist on structure. Not just structure, because we also have a responsibility of the decisions that we make once we know what, we, what we've seen, right? But if we, if we can focus on structure rather than like good guys, bad guys, to me, that's a way that where we can reach forgiveness self-forgiveness more than anything. Mm. Because a way that we get so stuck on good guys, bad guys, we have a really difficult time accepting when we've made mistakes, when we have caused harm. Because the only thing that we know how to do is label people good or bad, and we don't want to label ourselves bad. And that's the importance of being able to see the monster in the mirror and be brave. If you haven't read Muhammad's book, Islam and Anarchism, this is that internal jihad of Islam. It's that internal struggle, and it's not just Islam. So many worlds have this, that it's about being, about who we're going to be. That's the Maya world as well. It's this question of being. Who do we want to be? Who are our ancestors? Do our ancestors define who we are? Right? Isn't it about who we're going to be now? And that we can recreate and we can transform. But in order to do that, we need to take a, a bigger look at the context that we're in and how then that shapes the choices that we make. And then as warriors and healers, we go in and try to do some work and try to not raise consciousness, but to, at least speaking for myself, the best education I have ever received is not people telling me what to think, but letting me see that I had been unconscious about this thing, and now I'm conscious about it. And that's how I can keep learning and learning and learning. Thank you. When did passports come into common practice? Yeah, I, my understanding it was that it was in the 19th century. Very, very, I know, I was so shocked, as we know them, that the, that the nation state itself is so new. I was shocked that Palestine's maps that I studied were 19th century constructions, because I remember when I was little and I was forced to go to Sunday school, I would turn to the back of the Bible and I'd love the maps. I was like, oh my God, these maps are like 2,000 years old. How did they know? No, they're 200 years old. You know, like a lot of this is very new. It's just so normalized because we don't get to learn about the history and the struggle that went into constructing them. And that's part of the reason why they, they remain so long is because we're just taught that they're normal. Something that I want to point out about this book is that it's not widely available yet. What this is is a printed copy from some compas in LA. I wanted to be able to have some books here. And like I said, I'd be missing the beginning. This is an all-volunteer effort, 
And so there's still some pr little proofreads that need to be done. So you're gonna see some mistakes and then like totally killed me because I'm a copy editor and like, you know, some people don't mind, but like I mind, you know? So um, if you wanna wait for the proofread version, that'll come out in a couple weeks. But if you wanna, if you wanna take this now, you absolutely you can. Um, and later, if you wanna get the proofread version, maybe what you could do, if you, I mean, you can cut this up and upcycle it and this art, you could send it back to the publisher and we'll exchange it for a proofread one and we'll upcycle it, you know? Because this is a really beautifully printed, this is super high quality, it's not like most books, because it went like, it's, it's from a high quality printer, because I was kind of in a jam, like I gotta have books, and my midwife says I have to give birth to this book. <laughs> so, that's it. Thank you. Thank you.